So it forced me to say a little bit about how the doctors of Ireland and indeed of, of Gaelic speaking Scotland uh, would have referred to the ailments that they saw, the treatments that they recommended and the parts of the body affected by various diseases and injuries. When Irish physicians first encountered medical writings by the likes of Gerardus de Solo and Guy de, de Choliac and Bernard of Gordon in the 14th and 15th centuries, those writings were in Latin and they routinely referred to concepts and materials, organs, bones and instruments, which would no one had any cause to refer to in Irish previously. That's not to say that Irish was completely lacking in medical terminology prior to the 14th century. Relevant vocabulary does turn up in legal texts and tales and in chronicles. Bolgach, for example, seems to have been applied to smallpox, but bolg means just a blister, and the same term was used to indicate the biblical plague of boils. Bolgach, Frankach, French blistering, was later used to denote syphilis. And the census of 1815 tells us that Irish people called the rash raised by the smallpox inoculation the doctor's blistering, distinguishing it from the disease itself, which by then was known as Bolgoch J, blistering from God. Names of body parts also turn up in early literature, but tellers of tales were interested in intestines, mainly to betray them as spilling out on the battlefield. And so we have general terms, and many of them for guts and innards and entrails, but we've no specific term for, say, the colon or the appendix. Speakers of early Irish could refer to the heart, but not to the left ventricle of the heart. At this distance, it's, we can't be entirely sure, I suppose, uh, why the Irish undertook to translate texts from Latin into their own language. Perhaps it had something to do with an urge to disseminate knowledge amongst fellow physicians. So we'll see it's questionable whether all of the terms that they come up with would have been widely understood. Perhaps there was always an element of prestige involved. The same Latin texts were being translated into a number of other European vernaculars, including English, French, German and Spanish around this same time. And it may have been thought important for Irish to play a role in that movement. Of course, those who set out to translate medical texts into English or French face the same fundamental problem as Irish scholars, that these Latin texts used terms for which they had no equivalents in their own language. There were gynecological works dealing with the expulsion of the placenta, treatises on fevers which mentioned bodily humours that had to be kept in balance. There were some remedies involving figs and pomegranates and exotic produce, and there were surgical works incorporating terms like Dura mater, that thick membrane of the brain for which we still use the Latin phrase in English today. And sometimes medieval Irish translators of medical texts took the same approach to these Latin terms as modern English takes to terms like Dura mater. That's to say they left them in the original Latin, adjusting slightly so that they conformed to the rules of Irish spelling. The pistachio nut was known in medieval Latin as fisticus. And in Irish texts, we get various variants of that with combinations of P and F, S and C. But it's fundamentally the same word. A treatment involving a skink liver identified as the main ingredient is a, a, a stintus, which seems to be just a slightly garbled form of Latin skinkus. It may be that translators weren't unduly concerned about leaving these Latin words relatively unchanged because they assumed that acquiring pistachio nuts or a skink were not likely to be viable options for Irish physicians. So it didn't matter too much if a reader of the text uh, really had no idea what the words were referring to. Oddly enough, the dura mater, that membrane of the brain, wasn't one of the terms that Irish scholars left in the original Latin. Dura means hard, mater means mother. And the Irish had words for each of those common concepts. So they just translated the individual elements of the phrase to give maher frue, literally hard mother. It's difficult to know what a would-be Irish surgeon might have made of a statement like, the first thing we encounter in the head is the hard mother. And many of the loan translations seem slightly surreal until we follow them back to the underlying Latin. 
One text recommends the skin of an old granach and a cure for the prolapse of the womb. Now, an old granach means an apple full of seeds. And from an Irish point of view, we might well wonder what this seedy apple would be until we're reminded that the Latin word for a pomegranate is malum granatum, which is exactly the same meaning. And just to keep with the produce theme, here's mesokoch, the adjective which is found applied to the testicles. It's slightly worrying description because on the surface mesokoch means full of acorns. But of course the Irish word is translating Latin glandulosus, which means both glandular and full of kernels. So this practice of kind of calking or loan translating had the effect of employing very familiar Irish words in unfamiliar ways. Easier to grasp really are some examples where Irish words developed logical sort of extensions of meaning in the medical domain. Suach was a word for a container for liquid. Uh, it seems to be sometimes a, a, a drinking vessel, sometimes maybe more like a bowl. But to translators of medical texts, suyuch became a word for a fluid-filled sack or vessel of the body. As such, it occurs in a passage discussing miscarriage in cows, where it seems to signify the amniotic sac. And elsewhere, we find it applied to the gallbladder, to the spleen, and to blood vessels. Similarly, tenachar, a word which is known maybe from about the ninth century as a word for smith's tongs, was used now in medical vocabulary as a word for forceps. And brit, this is a word for a, a, a strip or a piece of cloth, and we show it in Siobhan's recipe uh, for that mixture of strawberry and the stem of cowslip was really strained through a linen cloth. But it has another role to play in the language of medicine. Brit had a little diminutive form, bretine, a little strip of cloth. And that was repurposed to provide a means of referring to a partially permeable membrane in a living organism. Interestingly, while breting sort of spans two domains, it can be used for a piece of cloth and it can be used also for a membrane. But the associated adjective bretinoch is only found in a medical sense, meaning membranous, and only found in manuscripts really from the late 16th century onwards. So sometimes translators of medical texts into Irish found appropriate terminology just by taking a word that already existed in the language and sort of directing it into a specialised use. As you might expect from what I've been saying, different scholars also took different approaches to translation and multiple terms referring to the same diseases, organs and processes existed all at the same time in medieval Ireland. Some terms seem to be used only in a single text, as if there were a kind of innovation thought up by one particular translator and it never really caught on. So I'm going to leave you with a very quick look at some of the different ways of referring to the palatine uvula, that little conical projection which hangs down from this back of the soft palate, uh, or if you prefer that kind of little fleshy bit uh, in the back of your throat. Uh, the uvula is maybe an un unlikely candidate to have produced one of the most interesting clusters of medical terminology from late medieval Ireland, but so far I have found an instance of the Latin term being borrowed to round off a list that's all otherwise in perfect Irish. An example of this phrase, shina sheathen, seems to be made up with the word shina, which is used to describe a small fleshy protuberance, and it's best known kind of from, in the sense a teat or a nipple. And sheathen can mean a blast of wind, so the whole thing means, seems to mean something like uh, the wind lump or the wind bump. There's a nice variation of that, it's actually more common. Shina shon seems to incorporate the proper name shon. Uh, I don't know if that's sort of influenced in any way by the idea of the Adam's apple, but at any rate, medieval Irish has a term for the uvula, which seems to mean roughly kind of Sean's lump, Sean's bump, maybe Sean's nipple, uh, something like that. And then we've an ever present translator, uh, ever practical translator who seems to be unconcerned about what the doctor called this organ, as long as he could identify it correctly if he needed to remove it. That translator refers to the uvula simply as the thing like a tongue in the throat.